Let me talk about the crux of the problem here. Almost immediately, Amy, this blonde woman, she tells us she doesn't feel like her, meet, her needs are being met by her boyfriend, Billy, right? It's not all I want. It sounds like he's working very hard to meet one need in particular. But she's saying, I have more needs than just that. So her exact words are, he's such a jerk. That's not all I want, right? And this lack of paying attention to the whole person is creating an offense for Amy. There's this wall that's starting to grow between the two of them, which brings up another saying in Proverbs 18. So this is verse 19. Making up with a friend you have offended is harder than breaking through a city wall. Once you've hurt somebody, rebuilding that relationship takes a lot of effort, considerable effort. And that's at least one of Amy's crisis of relationship things that she has going on at the moment. But then she introduces another one as she tells a story about this woman, Mary, he, who used to live in the house. Now, I find it interesting that she connects to a story like Amy's because it's a little bit familiar to her own in some ways. She says, you know, Mary didn't care about, sorry, Mary's father didn't care about her desires. So here we have Amy. Of course, she resonates with that. In this particular moment, she's saying, I have needs. Mary had needs, but there are people in each of those people's lives that are only tuning into one thing, one aspect of need. So then if we look back at Proverbs 1824, we read, unreliable friends quickly come to ruin, which seems to be Mary's story a little bit. She actually literally dies, and we could make a case that that's not so unusual back then, but then we get verses like this, Proverbs 1814, we hear, being cheerful helps when we're sick, but nothing helps when we give up. So maybe Mary died just because she had tuberculosis, and that's a thing. People die from tuberculosis. But maybe it's more complex than that. Maybe she can't find a reason to live. So there's lots of stories like that, right? We hear about those older couples that live together for many, many years, and then one dies, and the other one dies shortly thereafter. That's a common story. So I'm speculating. Who even knows? But it's interesting to think about. Mary dies this timely, untimely death. It's timely in that she doesn't have to marry the rich old geezer. Right? She doesn't have to marry the old man. But it's untimely, too, because she's too young to die. So maybe Jane resonates with that. Maybe she feels like there's a part of her that isn't quite living, that, she, that story's triggering something for her. And then to add to that, Amy and Jane are experiencing a similar breach of relationship. So Jane seems to be filling one need in particular. You need an extra person in the house in order to make ends meet. But beyond that, she's not really providing companionship. She's not really in tune to that need for companionship. So she's not being a good friend like what we read about in Proverbs 18.24. In the example here that I mentioned with my friend from work, she's willing to drop everything, even though she's really busy, to say, what's up? Tell me what's going on. And that experience with somebody listening to me, it carried me through very difficult times. Even the memory of those experiences can help me get through difficult things to this day. Just having a warm, fuzzy feeling somewhere inside of us can help us push forward a little bit. So if we don't break that cycle, what happens to us? I think all of us have this need for relationship. It's a circular problem. It affects friendships, roommates, dating couples, married people, and it has something of a, like, all this has happened before and will happen again quality. It's circular. If we don't break the cycle, it just keeps happening over and over again in all sorts of ways, but always with a similar result. Now, notably, as Amy's situation in the house becomes increasingly stressful, she makes this really odd choice. <laughs> I'm not going over there. I don't know if I really want to. And then the house is stressful, and the situation is, is bad enough that she says, I'll take some relationship over no relationship at all. I'm going to Billy's, right? So she makes a funny choice. When, it, when push comes to shove, she'll at least take something over nothing, all of which culminates with Jane being accosted by the ghost of Mary at the end there, right? And so one of the things that we talk about at the premiere, we had this Q&A panel, and we asked, is Mary a literal ghost or is she a metaphorical ghost? It's a funny question to ask. But in other words, is Jane literally accosted by Mary at the end of the film? 
Is she sort of getting what's coming to her because shame on her for being so mean to her roommate? Or another possibility is what we see something of a metaphor because Jane has needs too, right? By the end of the film, we finally hear about Jane's needs. She has work to do. She needs to get her work done. She's in a stressful situation. But instead of just saying so, she goes to great lengths with this practical joke to get some peace and quiet. I mean, she goes out of her way with this joke a little bit, right? So even if she doesn't literally die, she's certainly not living a full life. There's this huge gap going on between her and her roommate. So nobody in the film then is being fully represented as fully living. Amy doesn't feel like Billy is seeing her as a full person. Mary's father wasn't seeing her needs. Jane isn't seeing Amy's need for a relationship in the moment. And Amy isn't seeing that Jane needs peace and quiet. Nobody's needs are being met. It's one big unhappy mess. And unless we find our way out of that cycle, Solomon tells us in another wisdom book that we're just going to keep experiencing the same difficulty over and over again. So that's Ecclesiastes 1.9. What has been will be again, and what has been done will be done again. So if that's the case, and we're just going to keep repeating this if we can't break it, how do we break the cycle? How do we engage with the multifaceted aspects of who we are and who the people around us are? Is there a way out of being afraid that we're going to be perceived as needy? Right? Because I was like, oh my gosh, this quiz just proves how needy I am as a person. Is there a way out of, of that fear? Is there a way to move beyond putting up walls so that we get back to friendship and we don't lose hope to the point of despair? So we'll talk about that. How do we find a way into better relationships? And the first thing on your program is this. Maybe it's okay to acknowledge and even claim that it's healthy and normal to need things from a relationship. Amy's saying, I need more than romantic passion from my relationship with Billy. She's also saying, I need more than help paying the bills with Jane. Jane is saying, I need to be able to get my work done, just on a practical level. And don't we all have various needs? Sometimes when Dominic and I are in a fight, he'll say, like, what's, what's bothering you? What's really bothering you? And I'll have this whole list, this and this and this. And, and he'll say, yeah, but what's really bothering you? And I'll say, it's not one thing. It's all of these things. It's not that I'm being irrational. This is just my life. But... Part of the reason we're in a fight at all actually is my issue. So most of us aren't quite aware of our needs, right? We have trouble expressing our needs. So instead of me being able to say, I need help, or I need someone to tell me I'm doing a good job, right? I need those words of affirmation. I'm, I go on the offensive instead, and I say, you aren't doing anything around here. And here's all the ways that I feel like that's true. Now, of course, that's not true, right? Because if you look at our lives, neither one of us is living a particularly lazy existence these days. We don't really just sit around and do nothing. But instead of getting in touch with my needs and risking being vulnerable, I'll put up this wall and I'll say, the issue has got to be you. I'm doing my thing. What's going on with you? So if I slow down and I just think about it, a better way of articulating my issues at that particular moment might be to the effect of, <laughs> I'm feeling like a failure right now, right? But that takes vulnerability to say, I feel like a failure right now in some particular way, and I'm looking for any way at all to project those feelings of failure somewhere else. I need to not be a failure so that I don't feel bad. And you seem pretty safe. I'll put it all on you, right? So how do we get out of that? First, I think we need to slow down long enough to say, I have needs, and it's okay that I have needs. Having needs does not make us selfish or weak or dependent. Needing help doesn't make us selfish, weak, or dependent. Needing a listening ear does not make us selfish, weak, or dependent. Needing physical touch does not make us selfish, weak, or dependent. We have needs. We have lots of them. That's part of being human. 
So once we can do that, then we probably need to get in touch with what those needs are exactly. So we can acknowledge we have needs. What are they? And this tends to be different from one person to the next and even from one moment to the next. Sometimes we need more passion for what it is that we're doing. We need to find a way to motivate ourselves. We were excited, now we're not so excited anymore. Or maybe, you know, sometimes we just scratch the surface and we say, I, I need downtime. Okay, that's a good start to recognize that we need downtime. But then we get that downtime and we don't feel satisfied. I need more downtime. So it's probably that we're not really in touch with what type of downtime we needed. So do we need downtime in our house or away from our house? Do we need creative downtime or do we need downtime where we don't do anything at all? Do we need to get out? Do we need fresh air or do we need sleep? What kind of downtime do we need exactly? And, you know, sometimes it's not even what do we need more of. Maybe it's what do we need less of. I need less stress. So there's the surface. I need less stress. Well, what specifically do we need? Do we need more partners in order to spread the stress around? Do we need a different commute schedule? Do we need a larger income? Do we need smaller bills? What kind of less stress is going to make the less stress work out for us? But most of us, you know, we're kind of like, you know, I don't want to appear to be needy. I want to be the person that helps people. I want to be the noble one. I want to be the smart one. I want to be the wise one. I don't want to be the needy one. So first we need to be able to say, it's okay. It's normal and healthy to have needs. And then we can be happier people just on that level. We can be more available to others once our needs are met. So that's the first thing. Secondly, once you discover your need, communicate it with someone. So this is yet another layer of vulnerability that I think we'd rather not face because there's this chance that people might reject us. They might not be the good friend to us that we're hoping that they will be. And we might end up feeling more needy and more disappointed for having even tried to be vulnerable in the first place. And those are real possibilities. I don't mention them just to shrug them off. I've certainly tried myself many times at various points to be like, I have a need. And then I feel like somebody blows it off, right? So one time I was trying to communicate my need for help and somebody said, well, you know, you're not the only one that's busy. And that's certainly a true statement. It's probably true that that other person needed help in their own lives at that particular moment. So the, the, the possibility that we can feel not so good for being vulnerable is there. I'm not blowing it off. The struggle is real. Maybe we actually do need to have a plan in place then ahead of time for people that we can trust, people that we can be vulnerable. So maybe we go to someone that we feel close to and who we feel will hear us reasonably and we make a plan. And we, maybe we say, hello, friend, that I'm choosing to be vulnerable with, right? <laughs> I'm trying to turn over a new life, a new leaf, <laughs> Life leaf. I want to start doing a better job of being aware of my needs, and I want to start doing a better job of communicating those needs more clearly. And I think this is going to help me be happier in general. <laughs> I think if I can get this out in the world, something's going to change for me. And I'm hoping that I'll be more effective even, right? So I've got all these goals. I've got all these plans. This is why I'm doing this. And I feel like this is a big step for me. And so I was wondering, can I practice with you? And maybe... If I discover that we have, I have a need, maybe I'll just share that with you first. I'm going to get it out in the world by sharing it with you first. And so I'll tell you, I personally tried to cheat this one like by not using an actual person. I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll speak to myself. I'll use myself as the vulnerable friend. And it doesn't quite work. So I'm in my car, and I admit to myself that I'm feeling some particular need, and I'm wildly sympathetic to myself. It's amazing. But then I go and I share with that other person, and it doesn't go that well because the wall is already up, right? We've already created this breach to begin with. So for that person, it's sort of like hearing, okay, this is your typical, you always want something from me, right? So sometimes we need to have an explicit conversation ahead of time before things get crazy to say, I'm going to try and turn over this new leaf. I was wondering if you would try this with me. And then we've got it. Or we've got some ground to work with a little bit. So that's, that's that one. Now, point three, allow others to have needs and practice respecting their needs. So this is classic, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? Recently, 
I've found I've been forging some new relationships in the community, and I've noticed there's this thing. It's real, this give and take. So some people have recognized if I start a relationship out by asking, what can I do for you, then it's likely that the other person will eventually return that favor in kind, or not, right? So it doesn't always work that way. I've certainly had friendships where I do more of the giving, but those friendships inevitably don't go very well over time, right? We, we start to connect less often, and it stands to reason because it's kind of a one-way street. I do all the giving, you do all the taking, and so those, those tend to trail off. But there's another proverb in 18. This is verse 21. It says this, words can bring death or life. Talk too much, and you will eat your words. <laughs> so the proverb in particular is talking about words. It's talking about talking too much. And, but I think it can also be true of anything. For a relationship to thrive, it needs to be a two-way street. Take too much, and your friendship's going to go away. So it's kind of, I'll help to meet your needs. You'll help to meet mine. We'll recognize that our needs are not always identical to one another and that our needs are going to change over time. That's normal. That's human. So then we think of a movie like A Regular Haunt. I think it exists. I think somebody writes something like this because we can all relate to this idea that we have needs and they're not being met. So is it possible to stop that cycle, right? So we've talked about how this can be a cycle. Is it possible to be a catalyst for change? Sometimes we talk about that around here, like one head turns and another head turns and another head turns and pretty soon you've got a thing, you've got a movement. So can we be a catalyst for change? Can we be a group of people that start to help others become friends that bring life? Is that possible? And so we're gonna go into this time of worship and reflection as we always do. And what we're gonna do in that is just take a few moments to first just ask God, do I have a need that I should be addressing right now? So can I even just get in touch with that? And then we'll ask God, who could I talk to about that? So we'll do both those things. Why don't we stand together? Yeah. So Lord, as we talk about needs, Maybe for some of us, it will take us about a half a second to, to know what our needs are. But Lord, we've also established that sometimes those are our surface needs. So maybe there's something deeper there that we need to be in touch with. So God, would you speak to us right now? Is there any need in particular that it would really serve us to address? And Lord, as we think about that, would you also speak to us about who could I talk to about this need in particular? Who, who's a safe place for me to land with? So Lord, we lift up all the needs represented here, the ones that we're aware of and the ones that maybe will come up as we think about this more. And we lift up our relationships to you, our, our need for relationship and our need for vulnerability and the ability to speak honestly. God, would you be providing for those needs? Would we find answers to this prayer in particular? If we have relationships which, you know, there's already a wall and breaking through that wall is a challenging thing, God, would you work miraculously in those relationships to break down those walls so that we can be vulnerable with each other and receive from each other in the various ways that we need to. Lord, would you send your spirit of abundance that when we hear about each other's needs, that it wouldn't 
It wouldn't freak us out and scare us because we've only got enough energy to handle ourselves. Would you bring a spirit of abundance that your love is, is going to go around and we don't have to be a miser with it and it's, it's going to be okay. So would you give us hope and abundance? Would you supernaturally bring wisdom that when we hear these needs that we're able to interact with them well? Hallelujah. In Jesus' name, amen.